I want to thank Steve and, and the, uh, all the technical staff for making this happen today, and uh, especially Steve for inviting me. This is my first year at Expona, and uh, let's have some fun here, huh? Um, I don't know if you know who I am. My name is Bob Hodes, and uh, I've tuned over 1,000 rooms worldwide. I've been doing uh, nothing but room tuning since 93, and that involves uh, ground up design to just going into somebody's room that's not unhappy with the room and, and correcting the issues that are uh, going on with it. Most of my clients are professionals, uh, the recording studios, the uh, post production and film studios, you know, people that are making the media that you guys are listening to are clients of mine. Uh, one of my big projects, in fact, this, this slide right here is a project where I did the room design <clears throat> and uh, set the system up and uh, tuned it into the room. And uh, this fellow, I would think most of you know who he is, he's Paul Stubblebein, and he's the mastering engineer for reference recording. So uh, while audiophile is a small portion of what I do, uh, as far as I'm concerned, audiophile listening habits enter into everything that I try to do. And uh, this is, we're gonna kind of run through this quickly. I know that people have questions and what I nor normally this is a two plus hour thing that I do, but we're gonna try to hit the high points and, and uh, try to get you some information that might help you with your rooms. So what's involved in room tuning? Um, these are not concrete numbers, it's something I made up, but it's what I kind of feel over, you know, uh, through experience, what I can accomplish. 70% of that is uh, to find the right place for the speakers and the listener in the room. Um, I don't know what the heck is going on with this thing, but it's, I don't know why it's automatically changing things, but it is. Um, so uh, anyway, I need to minimize the issues of the room boundaries. That's the big thing. And uh, find that one magic place where all of the room reflections meet at the listening position without causing a lot of big cancellations. Uh, and so by finding that also, I can minimi minimize you know, modal issues. I mean, every room has modes, that's, that's for sure, but the boundary in, interference patterns are actually more important uh, in, in causing your problems than the, than the mode, you know, the modal uh, analysis of the room. 25% uh, of it is acoustical treatments. You know, I wanna solve the first order reflections. I want to try to adjust room size and, uh, and reverb time through diffusion, and of course, uh, base issues. I mean, really, that's everybody's issue. High frequencies are simple geometry, but uh, base is it, the base is the big problem, and every room is different. And especially if you're working with rooms that are not symmetrical, uh, something that I'm not adverse to doing is equalizing a room. Most of the pros are equalizing the room, studios and and post and film guys. I mean, everybody in film is equalizing their room. And so uh, in, a, in an audiophile scenario, if there are problems that you just can't fix acoustically, let's say you don't have enough space to attack a problem, uh, sometimes a good uh, minimum phase parametric filter can, can do wonders for solving a problem. So I'm, I'm not advanced, uh, adverse to doing that, but it's, it's the, basically the last resort. So my big thing here, I believe in the laws of physics, but other than that, I don't believe in any rules. I'm not a religious guy when it comes to audio. And, um, and so, So I think that the most important thing that you can do is get your, your system set up symmetrically. Um, this applies to your setup of your gear, your speakers, 
you know, the layout, layout, overall layout of the room. And uh, by having a good symmetrical setup, then you're going to find that the acoustical treatments that you want to use are going to work properly for both speakers. Uh, you're going to get better imaging, you know, better depth of imaging, center image, and better side-to-side -side image. Uh, this is very, very important. Uh, you know, I mean, Im imaging is as important as frequency response. And that brings in phase, you know, to the issue. And phase, to me, maybe is even more important than frequency response. So here's a typical layout that, you know, somebody sent me one day. And I'm just going to kind of use this as an example to show you why we had, um, you know, what, what we're going to try to cover here today. So let's see. Um, wow. Let's see if we've got a, this laser pointer. So here, here's a couple things. The good thing about this room is that both the speakers here are the same distance from the front wall. Uh, the bad thing is, is that you've got different distances from the side of the speakers to the side walls. That means that the first order reflections coming out of the walls to the listening position here, you know, bouncing off of this area of the listening position, those are going to have different time values. And that means you're going to get comb filtering starting at different frequencies. And you're going to wind up with a very, very skewed frequency response speaker to speaker. And, uh, and it's going to have a huge effect on your imaging. Uh, you know, and both speakers aren't going to be giving you the same information. It's going to destroy your center image. Uh, I mean, here's some things that are pretty clear. Uh, they've got you know, a chair right next to one of these speakers. They've got this speaker kind of firing into the couch. So you've got something that's a sort of a bass trap here on this side and nothing on this side. And then you've got a coffee table here. Uh, we're going to talk about coffee tables a little bit later. But what's happening is you're also getting high frequency reflections off the coffee table that are mixing in with the direct signal at the love seat. And that's a bad idea, too. So there's lots of uh, bad ideas here. Uh, let's go here. I'm going to see if I can nip this in the bud. So here's a, the setup that I ended up uh, doing for this guy. So we, now we've got the speakers same distance from the front wall, and we've got side to side, reflections evened out. Um, we've got a fairly equilateral uh, setup here, which is going to be good for imaging. Uh, we've taken the rug and put it so that it's picking up the first order reflections off the floor. So those are, you know, aren't as much of an issue. And we've moved the coffee table away from in front. So those reflections aren't coming up and mixing in and causing comb filtering. And then we've sort of made more sy symmetry with the couch and the love seat uh, it, while still creating sort of a nice living space uh, for this guy. Uh, I also put, to pick up some first order reflections up here, I put some uh, soft panels on the walls and then hung tapestries that fit into his aesthetic values, uh, you know, to kind of hide those panels and uh, get the first order reflections away. And that, uh, you know, that created, you know, the setup for this guy. Uh, something that's very symmetrical. The, the last thing that I did in this particular case that's not shown is, you know, of course, you've got this very live cavernous area here with the kitchen and entryway. And I put a curtain that he could draw across here to sort of isolate his space. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad idea, uh, you know, to have space behind you. But in this particular case, it was extremely live. And the amount of reverb that was coming back into the listening position was unacceptable. So we, we isolated that by some simple curtains. All right. So what you saw there was I took the speakers off of the long wall and put them on the short wall. And you know, uh, 
common sense and one of the, you know, one of the things that everybody accepts in this business is that you should put the speakers on the short wall and to, to maximize your bass response, have them shoot the length of the room. But that's not really true. Uh, the one thing that I found o over the years is that every room is its own unique animal. And the dimensions and the type of construction that goes into the wall are going to determine what kind of bass response you get out of the room. So I'm just demonstrating something here. This is a, um, whoops, sorry. What the heck? <laughs> so this shot that you're looking at is eight, eight hertz to 200 hertz. Uh, the system that I use for room tuning and analysis is a dual channel FFT. It's called a Meyer Sim System 3. It looks at phase, frequency, and coherence all in real time. And so I can work very quickly with it and, and get a good, very, very high resolution understanding of what's going on in the room. So instead of where you've got your 31 octave, you know, uh, analyzer, 31 band analyzer, uh, I'm using about 245 points uh, instead of 31 to do the analysis. And so, um, so this, what this is showing is the room uh, with the speakers against the short wall, which is, you know, the rule of thumb, generally. But you can see that you've got this great big giant hole here with a great big giant peak. I mean, the, and, and the, the peak to, to dip ratio, uh, you know, numbers are like, you know, 60 dB or something. I mean, this is a ridiculous scenario. So by putting the speakers, trying the speakers on the other wall, I mean, we're not getting a flat response, but we're getting something where we've greatly reduced peak to dip uh, numbers and have something that's much more acceptable to listen to. Uh, there's less deep bass here, but the overall, this is a, a much better listening scenario than this is. I know these, thing, these things look just completely awful to you, and I'll let you know in this room it's not great, but uh, you know, well, like I said, you want to try to minimize your troughs and your peaks when you're, when you're getting a room set up. So, let's see. All right, so this is a room that's uh, got the speakers offset like the, like the room that I showed you in the, in the example. So there's a different distance between the left speaker and the right speaker to the side walls, and this is, this is the result. So uh, you can see here that the left speaker has a fairly linear response and the right speaker does not have a, a, a linear response. And something that's really, really important too is that the left speaker phase is uh, much tighter, you know, time-wise than the right speaker. So there's a lot more going on, you know, a lot more phase delay in the right speaker than the left speaker. And that's going to cause its own set of problems when you're working with bass frequencies, which are basically mono in a system anyway. So, uh, so the ability to get the, get the speaker set up symmetrically in the room is, is really, really important. You want, you want your, frequency, your frequency responses and phases to match, and then you can effectively treat you know, with, with acoustics. So this is just an example of what happens uh, when you have the coffee table set up and uh, here's your speaker, here's your direct signal, here's the bounce off the coffee table and to the listener. And so what that does is that combs, causes comb filtering because the coffee table is almost a full frequency bounce, uh, that reflection. Uh, and a leather ottoman uh, is gonna do basically the same thing. You know, if you have to have your feet up, uh, I would encourage you to at least use you know, a, a cloth cover on your ottoman. But this is, this is what's going to end up happening. So um, this is a frequency representation of that, pic, that uh, reflection that you just saw. This is the room with the coffee table in front. These are the cancellations. You, you know, I mean, and you know that ideally, as close to the uh, center line as you can get, uh, that's, that's what you really want to have happen. 
also what, I'm, what I see in my system is coherence. It's sort of like a line by line signal to noise ratio. So things like reflections, distortions, all these things uh, affect you, the coherence and it, it's exactly what you think it is. It's your ability to hear clearly. And this is showing very poor coherence. In fact, beyond poor, this is bad coherence. You know, uh, up, up in this first third or quarter, uh, this is, would be sort of like ideal coherence in, in a room. But you can see how bad this coherence is. And by removing the coffee table, we remove that comb filtering and the cancellations, we get a much flatter response and our coherence cleans up quite a bit too. So uh, that's, you know, that's what, that's the, uh, the death knell of the coffee table. So the, the impulse response, in this picture what we're looking at is uh, plus or minus 70 milliseconds, and th this is time zero. This is time zero here, and what you're seeing, this, this is the timeline coming out in this direction. This is a typical dynamic four-way speaker, and what you're seeing here is you're seeing all these different arrival times very tight, you know, to time zero, and then you're seeing the woofer, and then the recovery time for the woofer is here. That's how long it takes the woofer to recover, recover from an impulse. So uh, that means this, this speaker is going to have fairly poor phase response. Um, where, as opposed to something like an electrostatic speaker, and this is just for an example, I'm not saying everybody run out and buy electrostatics, but when you have, here's your electrostatic, here's the single impulse from electrostatic, and the woofer recovery time, because a woofer is, for electrostatic is conventional, you know, conventional. And, um, but the tighter you can get the phase of a system, the more realistic it's going to sound. Uh, you have all the frequencies arriving at the same time, and a lot of issues that, that occur when you have long recovery times in woofers, uh, that sort of thing you know, makes the low end kind of sound too large, rolling around, you know, blobby, whatever, you know, whatever terms you want to use. But you have to... Uh, you know, you have to try to get that under control. So, the, you know, when you're looking at impulse response, you, you have to pay attention to, you know, your, your, how your woofer is performing in the time domain as well as the uh, frequency domain. So here's um, an example of the first order reflections that we talked about earlier. Uh, this is a... Well, no. Sorry, folks. This, uh, why this guy is, never did this before, but what are you gonna do? Uh, so we've got this wall reflection here that's about, you know, I don't know, 10 to 15 milliseconds out. And that's a short enough path length difference that your brain's not gonna really separate that out as a specific reflection. And so it's going to uh, change the coherence and it's going to change your perception. You're going to hear that as coming from the speaker as opposed to, let's say, a sidewall or a ceiling. And so what you want to do is you want to try to eliminate that either through diffusion or absorption. And uh, this is what it ends up looking at once you've treated, treated that reflection. Okay, and the location of the reflections. Uh, the last screen showed me that I could figure out what the time difference is, the path length difference, and I can get a, a tape measure out and go measuring around the room and say, oh, that reflection's coming from this point in the room. But um, uh, the other thing that's, that's pretty easy to do is to get a mirror because we're talking about frequencies above 400 hertz, high order reflections, uh, and you can, it's simple geometry. It's like billiards at that point. 
So the thing that, that uh, makes things easier to do is you get yourself a plexiglass mirror and you get a buddy you know, and you get him to hold the mirror flat against the wall surface. Now remember this is billiards. So the mirror has to be flat against whatever surface it's sitting against. And you can see here is uh, the speaker. Here's the microphone at the listening position. You know, obviously, this is 2D. The microphone is nine feet away from this speaker. And then here's the mirror. And if you can see the components, then you're getting a first order reflection. And of course, it depends on the off-axis response of your, of your system. Uh, but uh, generally, the, if you can see the component, you're going to get, get a reflection. And one of the tricks that I like to use, you can see there's a little Aladdin uh, genie sitting up on top of this speaker. Sometimes in this scenario, it's difficult to determine is it's the left speaker or the right speaker. And you do a little trick, you just identify one of the speakers and then it's easy to say, okay, that's the right speaker, that's the left speaker, uh, and, and get, uh, get the job done that way. So, that, so then you know where you want to treat your first order reflections. And I'm a surgical guy. I, I, I tend to want to not over treat a room. I, I believe in take care of the problem and leave the rest of the room alone. And once you've got all your treatments in place, your base traps and taking care of your first order reflections, then you can address the problem you know, like reverb time. Do, do we need more diffusion in this room? Does it need more absorption? Something like that. But in the very beginning, the most important thing that I want to do is to, uh, is to just take care of the problems you know, that, that, that are at hand, the, the major issues. And how do you treat first order reflections? Well, you don't ever equalize them because all you have to do is move your head a little bit and the path length differences are gonna change. And the equalizer isn't ha helping that at all. It's, you know, it, it's just simply correcting a frequency response. And so uh, equalization's not gonna work there. My general attitude is to absorb the front reflections and once again, do it, you know, do it surgically. Don't over-absorb. Over don't make your, your treatments too large. And diffuse the back reflections. And sometimes the ceiling. If you've got a low ceiling, I'll, I'll, instead of absorbing the ceiling, I would, I would uh, do some diffusion there. Um, the, I, there's a lot of guys that, you know, that like to diffuse the sidewall reflections. I'm a realist. I come from the pro industry where, you know, I want my imaging to be real and, uh, and I don't like it to be way outside the boundaries of the speakers. That's not really reality. And the reason that that sort of thing occurs when you diffuse a, a, a let's say, a front wall or a side wall reflection is uh, demonstrated here. I hope you can see. I can't see the colors here so I, from my angle, so I hope you can see this, but this blue line is a, is a reflection that was absorbed, and you can see how nice and, and smooth it is. And the bottom window is showing you a diffusion, a, 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 a reflection that was diffused. And you can see how much action there is going on here. You know, it's not nearly as flat as the, uh, it, as the absorbed reflection, and also the coherence isn't as good either. And so it's sort of like adding reverb into your system, artificial reverb into your system. Now, you know, I mean, if you like that sort of thing, we're, you know, this, this industry is full of opinions and s subjective opinions, and, you know, if you want your speakers to be larger than life, then, you know, that's your choice to diffuse. But if, you want, if you're trying to achieve something that's more like what the uh, engineer intended you to listen to, uh, then absorption is going to be the thing that, to do to, to take care of that first order reflection. So uh, these reflections, as you well know, I mean, a lot of you guys have problem rooms that affects coherence. So here's, uh, 
frequency response of a, a non-treated room, and here's the coherence up here. You can see how bad it all, it all really looks. And here we treated the reflections, and our coherence cleans up, and the frequency res response cleans up as well. So I know this, this is, you know, this is, uh, I believe, um, we're looking at about, you know, 400 hertz to uh, 22 kilohertz here. So this is, this is just, you know, the high end. Uh, I know this doesn't look like a flat line to you guys, but this is within plus or minus 6 dB at, a, at 48th octave resolution. And this is pretty good, actually. You know, it's not grand, but, uh, you know, you, you could sit down and listen to high end in a room that, that looked like this, and uh, you'd, you'd probably be pretty happy. So, but I know a lot of people aren't used to lo looking at high re resolution shots, and it's scary, you know. <laughs> it's definitely scary. So, once you've picked up your uh, reflections, then, you know, moving on to the base frequencies. And using a base trap, gives you a very universal, you know, uh, solution to a problem. And uh, it helps you create a larger sweet spot in the room. And, of course, you know, it helps you create a nice tight base, you know, uh, without any high Q peaks. That, you know, those are, it's fairly important. There are a lot of different styles you can use. There are the tuned membrane, uh, traps that like go into corners or are big boxes to be built in walls. There are the low profile uh, membranes, something like the RPG uh, plates and uh, broadband uh, uh, modex. And those, uh, you know, those are good in limited spaces, expensive but uh, effective. Uh, we, in the studios, we generally have a lot of space. And so we tend to build larger broadband traps, mostly in the backs of the rooms, uh, you know, to stop that back wall reflection from coming in out of phase. Uh, and then there are electronic tunable traps, not very popular and not used very often, but they can be effective to pick up some very high Q, uh, high amplitude uh, you know, peaks in a room. And when it comes to placing your base traps, it's really, really important that you put the trap in the right spot in the room. You can't, can't just willy-nilly put a trap in the room and expect it to do anything, because you could put it in a position where you've got a frequency null at the frequency you're trying to absorb. So you, uh, you know, it won't do anything. If there's no energy to excite the trap, it's not going to have any effect. So for me, I mean, this is not something generally that I can do by ear because over the years I've watched that and to see that in some cases I might fix a, a big problem and create another problem. And sometimes that problem's worse than the, you know, than the problem that I'm trying to fix. So one of the big issues uh, that there's lots of misconceptions about is that you, that all corners are bad. And everybody, even the guys that I have the most respect for building acoustical treatments today, sell these kits and they always contain corner traps. And I'm just gonna say to you that probably 30% of the rooms that I go into that have corner traps and they're having base problems, I wind up tearing the corner traps out and their base problem goes away. So I got this big hole at 100 hertz where I got, you know, go in there, see the base trap, pull it out, the 100 hertz hole goes away. You know, now you've got flat, you know, restored all the, you know, restored the issue. So once again, you know, it's not, this isn't predictable. It's something that needs to be done on a room by room basis. And, uh, you know, I've been, was a recording engineer, a musician, you know, I got started in 71 in this biz and you know, uh, it's very difficult to do by ear. Measurement really is going to get the job done. Plus, it also gives you an idea of what's going on in the room phase-wise. Okay, so um, here's a, an example of 
treating a base corner successfully with a uh, tuned membrane absorber. And the, the teal line here is the, is the hole in the room and the, the red line, you can see where we filled it in and uh, was able to restore uh, 18 dB of loss in the room by putting these, these corner traps in. And basically just started bringing one trap in at a time. Actually, I should say two traps because I did this symmetrically in the front corners of the room and building these traps up until I maxed out either by space or by, by treatment. And then started another set of corners and found that in this particular room, the front corners wanted to be treated, but the back corners didn't affect a thing. So uh, there was no reason to spend money on, on trapping the back corners. And I'm, I'm an experimenter. I like to go in. I want, I want to put the traps everywhere when I go in. You know, and uh, if we've got the freedom to do that, that's great. If you don't have the freedom, you know, I mean, a lot of rooms don't have the space or they don't have, um, you know, uh, the aesthetic, are, are willing to deal with the things on the aesthetic level. There are certain things like I talked about the low membrane or low profile membranes. These are four inches deep. This is an example of a, uh, of a home theater that I worked on where we put these low profile member membranes right into the wall in the back and that helped considerably. Here's uh, some diffusion panels uh, in a room that I had at, the, at another competing show. Actually, there's no show that competes with this show, but uh, this was a show in California and we just kind of killed that back wall by putting in those, uh, those uh, uh, diffusers back though, there. Here's a real simple solution. I just took an IKEA rug and a coat rack from IKEA, for almost, bought for almost nothing. Here, let's go back to that. And in this, in, in a typical hotel room, because you know, you're experiencing the fact that you're going to these rooms here, and you don't know, does the speaker suck, or is it the room that's making the speaker suck? You know. So that, that's a problem with these kinds of shows unless they're actually doing some treatments. And I did something very simple. I just took this Ikea rug, hung it from a coat rack, picked up, at, hung it off the wall so that I'd pick up some lower frequencies as well and eliminated those first order reflections. And the imaging in this room was phenomenal. So you don't have to spend an arm and a leg to, to make it happen. Here's uh, this, this next picture isn't all that grand, but uh, it's showing that, hey, whatever works, that's what you do. That's my attitude. So this room has a cloud that we built to pick up the ceiling reflections, and we lowered, uh, we adjusted the height of the cloud as I measured to get the height just right so it would, so it would pick up the base frequencies that we were trying to, to uh, eliminate. Um, I've got, he's got a pair of subwoofers in, in this room, and I know this looks weird, they're facing into the corner, but by facing in the corner, I changed the bounce, the path, the listening position, and there was a big hole around 80 hertz, and I eliminated that hole completely by front firing the, the woofers, and still maintained, uh, you know, maintained a, a good frequency response overall. Uh, we've also got space off the wall and hanging to make it even more effective, this is a real trap. Uh, you know, like I said, I'll, the client had these. If, if it works, use it. That's my attitude. Uh, and this actually did work here where we picked up a little more uh, base control in this room by, by just kind of hanging this thing off the ceiling. Obviously, uh, he's divorced. You know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 well, bef well, before this was, room was completed. Uh, but this was a dedicated room anyway. I mean, this was his, his man cave, but uh, yeah. it, it, that always helps. You know. But there, there are things, I mean, there's lots of things that can be done to minimize the aesthetic uh, impact of treatments. And that's one of the things that, that I've worked hard at, at in my career is 
is to utilize art or uh, you know, th things I told you I use tapestries in one room, you know, wall hangings. There are also today, you know, the, the uh, science of printing on acoustical fabric is getting better and better all the time. And you, there are some wonderful, wonderful acoustical panels that have printed uh, photos on them that are just, you know, uh, I mean, excellent, or pieces of art, you know, uh, art on panels. So. There are things that you can do to lower the, you, that make this kind of disappear in the room or make it become something that actually contributes aesthetically to the room. Okay, here's another room. Uh, this is down in uh, Southern California that we did. And, you know, uh, some of these tr wall treatments, you can see there's some wall treatments back here. Uh, this, this is first order reflection area, but this isn't, this is reverb control for his room. Uh, there's very little, you know, with a speaker like this Apogee, there's very little ceiling reflection. Once again, there's some, a little bit of reflection, but also reverb control. The diffusers back here, of course, this is a bipolar speaker. So, um, so these diffusers are actually picking up that first order reflection. So it's not, it's getting kind of sprayed around uh, broken up a bit and sprayed around so it doesn't come directly back to the listening position and uh, and then cause, you know, extreme cancellations. Uh, it actually adds to the sense of space in the room uh, this way. Um, now, if this was a set of conventional front-firing speakers, uh, this sort of unit uh, isn't necessarily anything except uh, a decoration. Uh, I know that, uh, you know, it's, this is sold as something that, that you know, you should do in, in your rooms, especially at your speakers start to get close to the wall. But you have to remember that unless you're getting a back wall reflection that's coming up and hitting this, your spe most, the speakers, front firing speakers are omnidirectional only below 200 hertz. And this type of treatment is only good, you know, in the upper mid-range and high frequencies. So it really isn't having much of an effect at all. You'd need a diffuser back there that's, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 inches deep to start to affect the frequencies that you want to affect uh, in a conventional sp uh, speaker. So, um, you know, just, point of reference on, on, the, on that sort of treatment. And l let me say this, there are things that I can't measure. You know, that's the, we don't have the science for at this point, but this, this, that's a pretty well-defined bit of science uh, uh, there as far as how, how the speakers behave. Okay, so equalization, um, that's, you know, kind of the, the, a big question, and in the pro business, you know, we're doing this so that uh, so that we can conform to standards. Because, you know, I mean, all films have to conform to uh, to a standard uh, as uh, as far as you know how the how the um, films play back in the in the theaters, and the theaters are tuned, the post production rooms are tuned, the dubbing stages are tuned. Uh, I've got a lot of cl film clients, uh, you know, uh, Danny Elfman, Hans Zimmer, James Newton Howard, guys whose rooms I tune that, um, and a number of them who actually use some, you know, high, very high quality speakers as well. Uh, and everybody has to conform to this one standard. Uh, but, you know, you can, you can create some bit of refinement in the frequency response. Uh, generally, uh, you know, we're talking about only affecting bass frequencies, you know, tuning bass frequencies, because, you know, the bass is hard to do uh, if, you know, if you can't get it done with, with acoustics and placement, uh, this is your last resort. A good minimum phase, complementary phase, parametric equalizer can allow you to remove a, a peak uh, that's, that's really annoying you. And um, 
uh, but the, this, the trade-off here is right here. You get a much smaller sweet spot. So you can't, th that room that you saw, they had three chairs across and it had a second row in the back. Uh, if you're using equalization, that's not gonna be good for everybody. That's gonna create a fairly small sweet spot uh, that might be good for the front row only, or it might be good only for the guy sitting in the center in both rows. But generally, you know, somebody's going to lose out. What's going to end up happening is, you, you know, it, let's say at the left, in the center speaker, it's going to be nice and flat, but as you move off axis, the peak that you've removed might become a dip at that point. So, uh, so that's, the, you know, that's the thing that you really have to watch for when you're doing equalization. As to the type of equalization that you're doing, I'm a fan of parametric equalization because it allows me to actually tune into the problem as it exists. Uh, the top window here is, um, is showing you what a third octave equalizer looks like overlaid onto a room, room problem, and you can see that in order to try to get this peak, the only frequency on the equalizer that, that I'm given is, is right here, and it's fixed into a third octave frequency. But when, I, when we go down here with a parametric, I've got a little more control here. I've got the same thing, same thing here. You know, I've got more control to actually shape the equalizer to fit the problem of the room. And it's, to me, it's a no-brainer that that's, that, you know, that's what I want to use. I want the best tool I can possibly get when, when, you're, when we're tuning a room. Okay, subwoofers. I, you know, I know that a lot of you guys don't like subwoofers, and I can understand that. But in some cases, uh, you know, subwoofer is the best thing you can possibly use. Uh, frequency extension certainly... Is, is one thing, and power, you know, power. The, the, a big one is right here, giving yourself more freedom to place your mains, to place your, your satellite speakers. That means you can concentrate on things like the imaging and the depth, you know, the side-to-side the -side imaging and the depth and, uh, and high-frequency response and interaction with the room and don't have to worry so much about the bass response because the woofer, subwoofers, you can move those around, have a lot more freedom to move those around. You don't have to worry about imaging. And you can find an idealized place for the subwoofer. Uh, the one thing that you have to be really, really careful about is when you're doing this, interact this, this uh, placement is the phase interaction. Uh, of, the, of the subwoofer to the satellites. Because if you don't get the phase to overlay just right, you're, you, you know, the, you're gonna be able to identify the sub position. It's not gonna sound good. You, it's gonna be all the bad things that subwoofers are. You know, it's gonna add to phase delay. You're, you're not gonna enjoy it. So, so I'm a, down here, I'm, I'm a stereo subwoofer guy personally. But if you have one sub, you know, we're, we're gonna place it. Um, our time frame is getting tight here, so uh, I think I'm gonna turn this over to questions, and if we run out of questions, then, you know, we'll go back to the show. So. Oh, wow. so you ever feel the day when you're going to the the microphone in the corner? Does that help position base traps? Oh, no, pressure mapping is really important if you want to properly put up a bass trap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, you know, if I've got a problem, you know, I mean, let's say that, that hole at 70 hertz that I showed you that we filled in with the, with the uh, membrane absorbers. Um, yeah, you, you know, you take a microphone and you start moving around the walls and, and find out where's the pre where is that pressure the highest because that's where your trap's going to be the most effective. Okay, that's, that's right. Yeah, that's... Well, the coherence is part of the uh, impulse response uh, uh, um, mathematics. So the, the, the SIM system that I use looks at the microphone, input to the microphone, the output of the noise source, 
the input to the, to the uh, amplifier, and if you're using equalizers, the input and the output of the equalizers, and then it does a transfer function across all those points. And so uh, once you've set the propagation delay, you, you set up your microphone and your speaker, and then you set a propagate, the, the system does it, you know, you hit the buttons, but the system removes the delay time from the microphone to the speaker. It removes that time, and that be, so the microphone thinks it's sitting there right at the, right at the speaker, and that's how it can see the room reflections, you know, and identify them in, in the time domain. And then also the calculation for the coherence comes, comes out of that as well. No, no. Oh, I, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know every, every program out there, but no. And, and coherence, you know, it, it, that's part of your ear function, you know. Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> sorry, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. You're, you've got the floor, I guess. Well, you know, uh, oh, he said, how do I deal with phase response when problems when I see, see the phase response issues on, the, on my screen? And so uh, some of the phase issues are caused by the reflections. So by minimizing reflections, I can, you know, I can clean up the phase response. Some phase responses are caused by the components themselves in which case there's really nothing you know, that I can do about that. You know, I can't re, you know, uh, realign the speaker. But I, there's, that's one thing that I can do with the subwoofers. Uh, it's a few slides past right now. You know, uh, but I was going to show you that in, in, in how to, you know, how I can bring a subwoofer that ha doesn't have, has poor phase interaction with the main speaker and align it. And, you know, like I said, once I do that, then the subwoofer simply disappears uh, in the auditory domain. You, you really cannot identify that there's a subwoofer attached to the system. It seems like it's just coming from your speakers. So, sir, behind, yeah. Well, the laws of physics are the laws of physics. You know, I mean, you can't get around that. Um, but, uh, you know, even my, my symmetry rule, if I'm in a room that's not symmetrical, then, you know, I will, I may opt for an asymmetrical placement of the speakers, you know, to try to balance, get that balanced out. Because what's really important is that, like I said, is that you wind up with like frequency response left and right and like phase response left and right. You know, uh, that's the thing that's going to give you, the, you know, the best experience, listening experience, and, and the best imaging as well. You know, the imaging is so important. Yes, sir, back there. I have a room that I have a massive 60 hertz boom in, mm -hmm. and I have magnifying speakers, and I just got foam to the corner of these blocks to uh, try to break it up, and this is what Right. So, um, so 60 hertz is probably a, let's see, you know, 18 to 20 foot wavelength. And, and a half by 12 by 20. Yeah, but that, that, that's, at this point, that's not, not the issue. Your, cor your corner trap's the issue. So you've got this 18 to 20 foot wavelength. And you need, in order to absorb a wavelength, you need to at least be able to absorb a quarter wavelength. Okay, so you need a trap that's several feet deep, or you need a trap that's tuned to 60 hertz. And so that's the solution to your problem is, and if you're sure that the, that the issue is in the corner, then you, you need to buy uh, something like an RPG Modex that's tuned, actually tuned to 60. Uh, because you're not gonna, you don't, just don't have the space. And the other, you know, the, or, or cheaper solution, if it's a, a, a room that 
you only have one seed in, you could equalize that. You know? But once again, a smaller sweet spot. But it's a solution that's done when you're done doing that. You know? It just depends on, for me, equalizers are always, I listen with them in, and, and with the client, listen with them in, listen with them out, and let the client select, do you like the room this way, do you like the room this way? And uh, you know, a lot of people in the good old days, you know, the equalizers had tons of phase re issues and and weren't very good. But you can get high quality equalizers today that aren't going to significantly affect, you know, the, the response of the system or the, the listening experience. And uh, you know, the question is, is it better with it or better without it? You know, does the, the negative issues? by putting an equalizer in, overcome the problem that you're trying to solve? Or does solving the problem just make you go, oh, thank God that's gone? You know. So, yes, sir? For most types of home listening environments, what type of radiation pattern speakers do you prefer that they have? Like dipoles versus front firing lock speakers? Is either one well, I, you know, I mean, front firing speakers are easier to deal with uh, because you've always, with bipolar speakers, you've always got this bounce coming off the front wall that's coming. So, you know, they're a little tweakier as far as setup goes, but I have the tools that allow me to see all that. So, so it, you know, it's not, for me, it's not that big a deal. To do something like that by ear is you know, is a bigger deal. And, and let me say this, that, you know, a lot of you guys are good listeners. And people who are good listeners over a period of time eventually move their speakers around, their listening position around till they go, oh, you know, this is it. I mean, I've been in guys' rooms that have been moving their speakers around for six months to a year and ended up, you know, doing minor tweaks, minor tweaks, because these guys, you know, had good ears. Uh, and, but the thing is that when I'm hired to come in and do a job, I've got one day to get it done. And so, you know, the measurements let me get right to it and get it done quickly. So, uh, you know, the, but the, the really, one of the big things uh, is off-axis response. That's really, really important. You, that's, and that's something that a lot of audiophile guys don't publish, suspect they don't publish on their speakers. But you really want the, the response at 30 degrees off axis or 50 degrees off axis to be very, very similar to the, the direct response of the, of the system. That's, that's huge when it comes to, to you know, uh, room reflections and things like that. You, you can live with a lot more with room reflections with a pair of speakers that has good off-axis response. Uh, if it doesn't have good off-axis response, you know, that affects imaging and also it'll reflect, you know, it'll just compound the problem when it bounces off of a wall. Yes, sir. So many pictures, speakers were angled, talking about <coughs> angle response, that angling intentional? Yes, yes, and that's something that I do speaker to speaker. Um, I mean, over the years, I've seen lots and lots of speakers, and uh, you know, but I'm always running into something new, and uh, that's one of those things that gets done. You know, when I'm all done with a room, then it's time to sit down and listen, and really, the final judgment is is here. You know, this is the, you know, this lets the tools let me work really fast, and uh, and you know, get us most of the way there, but the end result is always determined by what's it sound like. And uh, based on things like off-axis response, you want, and, and also the distance of the sp speaker from the listener, the toe-in on the speakers is going to be different in different spaces and uh, obviously manufacturer to manufacturer. You know, so that, but you know the ear is really the end result. You know I have set up subwoofers that actually looked 
pretty darn good you know, in the frequency domain. And I was kind of like going, eh, you know, the phase domain isn't what I'd like it to be, but you know, this, this is really nice and flat. We're going to go with this. And then when we sat down to listen, it was just like, no, this is unacceptable. You know, it's better to have the, the problem be in the frequency domain than the phase domain. You know, so, uh, yeah, ears. Yes, sir. What is the most common problem for the lack of phase? Um, well, you could have the walls removing. I've been in rooms where the walls were just removing the base from the room. Uh, they were, you know, becoming membrane absorbers and just sucking things out. I've also seen rooms where they over-treated the room. Uh, they kept adding more and more base traps to the room and eventually sucked all the base right out of it. <laughs> so, you know, but, you know it, it, but every room, it varies. You know, it could be construction, you know, it, and it, you know, it could just simply be uh, that you need more reinforcement, you know, or a null. I think that our time is up. I'm sorry we didn't get to more questions. Uh, one, question. one question, yeah, because the, the guys made me run, well, we're running over too, but the guys ran over. Sorry. You have to go for uh, a big basketball. Okay. Uh, how high up would it be for the first one? Do you get Oh, well, well, I mean, first order reflections, base traps, those are kind of two different issues to me. So, and it's a little, it's complicated, but I'm going to say that um, I don't have a rule that you have to go floor to ceiling. Okay, that's just not one of my rules. You know, I, you know like I said, I, what, if, if that's what makes your room, room work, that's what I'm going to do. If just treating the floor, Sometimes it's just in the bottom corner, you know, or sometimes it's in the top corner, you know, or it's a wall, a ceiling junction or something, wall ceiling junction. Uh, yeah, I look at with the analysis, yeah. All right.